Thank you to the ABC team for the invitation, especially Sophie and Bobby, and I'm very glad to be here and talk about designing and evaluating NIME. But we feel, first we'll start to listen to a short audio extract. What is it? Huh? What else? The underground. The underground? A while. A while? <laughs> That's interesting, yeah? So, uh, this, as a description, <laughs> one of my first music productions using field recordings, in particular a contact mic inside a, inside a suitcase, capturing the contact of the suitcase wheels with the floor. And I've been using field recordings ever since, both in my practice and research. And I will come back to this later. So the outline of this talk will be revising NIME in a very quick overview, the past, present, and future. Uh, then to present the NICE framework, which is influenced by a feminist HCI approach to then move to present three NICE projects and conclude with some summary kind of uh, uh, description and takeaway message. So for this NIME past, present, and future, uh, the question is how many of you have heard about NIME? Can you raise your hand? Yes, it's about maybe a quarter of the room. So, yeah. So then can be an introduction for those who don't know and a revision or reflection for those who do? No. Uh, so NIME, what is it? Um, it? Is it an international conference? Is it an artistic device, process, expression, output? Is it a technical development? Is it an educational tool? Is it a community? Is it a digital musical interface interaction? Is it a speculative design tool? Something else? I would like to think that it's all of these characteristics and it keeps evolving. So NIME started in 2001, which is 23 years ago, as a spin-off of the CHI conference, which is this massive conference on computer and human interaction. And the visionaries Popu Rev, Lyons, Fels, and Blaine created this uh, initial workshop that became uh, an annual conference. And so it's nice to see uh, how they envisioned this, this workshop and how the, uh, NIME has evolved. So basically, uh, they highlighted, one, the, the interest on the impact of the interface technology on the musical culture, and two, how to design good musical interfaces. And also, if we look into the goals of the NIME kind of um, workshop, uh, they were interested in evaluating musical interfaces, identifying technological developments, kind of looking at the influence of cognitive science and psychology in the design and sharing like the collective experience. So if we jump ahead on time after like these yearly uh, events, uh, we can find like this anthology, looking back 15 years with uh, highlighting 30 articles. This uh, name reader was credited uh, between Jensenius and Lyons. And it's a nice representation of the artistic, scientific, and technological approaches of the community. And the proceedings, which are online available, you can check them out. They are seen and kind of uh, presented as a gold mine. So you can see many ideas there that can inspire you or also check things that have been done just to not bring them to will and so on. In my case, uh, I've been contributing to NIME for 15 years. So I started as a master's student at UPF, contributing uh, with a paper with Gerard, who's here. But then all over uh, these 15 years, I've been contributing yeah, with co-authoring uh, collaborations or solo work in terms of papers, performances, workshops, a panel. And I've been also Woman in of, uh, women, so we call it Winim, Winime or Women in Nime Officer for four years, which is part of the diversity working group. And the current um, person who holds this uh, position, Isabella Corinta Almeida, is contributing to, to this Winime 
uh, together with the diversity working group. And so in terms of contributions, I've been exploring different themes in collaboration or individually. They can range uh, from live coding to web audio to music information retrieval, mobile music, network music, women in NIME, and so on. So the NIME community is great. Uh, it's a great event, a great community, and uh, this, they have created or they, they have been hosting 23 editions so far. It's international, it's eclectic, it's interdisciplinary. Uh, it has different committees, uh, kind of addressing different uh, issues, if you like, related to diversity, to environmental issues, to ethics. And it has this very nice bottom-up approach of taking decisions, and it has developed its own identity besides CHI, this uh, bigger conference. But it also has some caveats that have been identified from within and that probably resonate with other communities, uh, neighbor communities. So scholars have reflected, reflected on the nine limitations and we will uh, kind of highlight three of them today. Uh, so one is on the technology kind of driven approach. And so in 2005, John Bowers and Phil Archer proposed the term infra instruments. So the infra instrument was presented as a kind of a new interface for musical expression. And it was defined as devices of restricted interactive potential with leader sensor enhancement, which engenders simple musics with scarce opportunity for conventional virtuosity. So here they wanted kind of to contrast with uh, the meta, hyper, cyber instruments. This resonates with a concept called uh, Do It Together, and this comes from this very nice book chapter written by Lisa Corey and David Novak that was published in the latest uh, edition of the Nicholas Collins book, Handmade Electronic Music. And so basically they highlight that Do It Together is more important than Do It Yourself. So the highlighted values uh, in this book chapter are that the hacking kind of helps to uh, criticize or question the, the electronic sound and the objectification of the electronic sound. So questioning the provided instruments that come to your hands and maybe just inquire them. It also presents or discusses the repair as part of the process, so why not bring the repair and also it kind of explores the participation and through these new ways of, of collaborate, collaborating, you can create new spaces and, and new ideas. So, but in essence also the sound appears as an easy way to start making music and, and very important that then the community can make a social change through this exploration of, of other ways of making sound. Uh, I'd like to talk about the sound-based music definition uh, at the Montfort University. Leilandi um, uh, is professor there and has several uh, books about this topic. But basically, it's this distinction between working with sound versus working with notes, musical notes. And so there is this term called sound-based music as the art form in which the sound and not the musical note is a basic unit. And this is a very subtle kind of change, but uh, the sound that you can produce from this perspective varies, but also it invites more people who might not have musical background to create music uh, from the very start. So there is also this notion of sound for all. Okay, we move to another ca caveat, which is quite common, <coughs> excuse me, in several uh, neighbor communities, which is the lack of diversity. So NIME has been also questioned with, from within. You can find different papers. Um, I'm selecting this one here today, which is the NIME presented as nuanced and interrelated mediations and agencies, <coughs> which is, has, has been written by Hayes and Marquette Bourbon. And basically in this paper, they kind of question that there are some crises in terms of the political and epistemologies from the, from the community, and they ask for or invite uh, the community to be more critical. So they kind of uh, ask, for example, to bring more the artistic practice into kind of the methodology 
but also maybe be more critical to the commodification of the academic research. And so also they claim that publication of diversity and inclusion statements is not enough. There should be more actions. This connects and resonates with the Izmir community, and I'm neighbor uh, community, and an hour ago, there was an inspiring, inspiring talk by Blair Kaneshiro on diversity in music technology related to initiatives and insights from music information retrieval. And so there is this uh, kind of a nice um, article by Georgina Bournes, which is very thought-provoking about how to diver diversify MIR. And so suggestions proposed by Bourne are bringing more interdisciplinarity, so for instance, collaborating with social sciences, but also being more critical with the research methods and the objects of analysis used uh, in the field. So for example, questions such as, can the community be more diverse? Can there be more musical diversity, musical cultures? So these are questions posed by Georgina Bourne. And then if we move also to the CHI conference, there, there are different uh, kind of proposals in alignment with the third wave. One is bringing feminist HCI in the design of objects. So in this paper, basically Bartzell proposes six qualities of feminist interaction that you can take into account when designing a new product. And I'll just um, go through the six uh, kind of characteristics very quickly. One is the pluralism of this idea that you should avoid a universal perspective, so consider different perspectives when designing. The second is participation, so bringing these participatory design approaches, so building with the community, building with the users, taking into account their opinions. Uh, the third one is advocacy, so try not to impose your opinions or your values on the product, so again, trying to uh, consider different uh, perspectives. Fourth, ecology, which is basically the awareness that there are several contexts, so it's not only the product, but what are, what are the contexts uh, that kind of embrace the product. Uh, fifth is the embodiment, so considering that there is an agency in the bodies, that everybody is different, so that should also be reflected. And sixth, uh, self-disclosure, so this transparency on how software effects um, software affects uh, the people. So basically being transparent, communicating, and, and acknowledging that there is a, an influence. So related to uh, this kind of uh, approaches about the lack of diversity and trying to bring, uh, or, yeah, bring more minorities into music technology, there is this publication related to my time at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology and the One Mute organization. So in this paper, Jawad and I proposed to investigate alternative usage of the technical term music technology to accommodate more diversity and fluidity into the field. So from interviews uh, with, inter interviews, uh, with uh, different music technologies uh, women, um, they were kind of not rejecting, but perhaps not identifying with this term. So perhaps it's a matter also of uh, questioning the terminology that we use uh, in order to attract more, uh, more um, minorities that perhaps, perhaps now are not interested or not attracted uh, with certain disciplines. So a third caveat concerns with the quality of the newness. And so, published this year uh, by Masu Morelli and Gensenius, they proposed to bring the O of the old into the name, uh, the name of the new. And so, the criticism is that the, perhaps all the name, um, kind of the names we call them, overlie focusing you know, on this newness uh, kind of character. So, they identify four strategies kind of to, to see how the life cycle of the object or the instrument um, you know, can, can be more sustainable. So they look into four categories. One is reuse, the reuse of the, of the instrument, the update of the instrument, uh, three, the complement of the instrument, so complementing to bring a longer life, and for a long-term engagement, so reusing it. So it's basically a, kind of a call to think about more sustainable products 
and kind of thinking, yeah, a longer term uh, life cycle of the, of the instrument design process. And also it's interesting they conceive the sustainability problem as a collective or community problem rather than an individual problem. So this approach resonates with the circular economy model. So if we compare with the kind of more present now, the linear economy model where we have the take, make and waste and all this ecological threat that it implies, the circular economy looks into taking waste out of the system. So it basically decouples the business growth uh, from resource consumption. So this is, can be an, also a nice way to think about this designing sustainable uh, instruments. So in the Japanese culture, we find traditional concepts that connect with circular economy. On the left, we see a book by Leonard Cohen on Wabi Sabi, which is a Japanese aesthetics uh, and philosophy approach in which the beauty of things are seen as imperfect, impermanent, incomplete, modest, and humble, and conventional, and kind of praising the nature based on and the soft. On the right, you also see the Kintsugi technique, uh, or also known as the golden repair. So this is a Japanese art of repairing broken pottery, where breakage and repair are part of the history of, of an object. Okay, so this concludes this quick overview of, of nine past, present, and future. And we move now to the NICE framework that I would like to present to you, which is this inspired by a feminist HCI um, intake. So the proposal basically is based on bringing sound into the equation, sound as a catalyst of musical diversity, promoting, so on the one hand, inclusion, so a more inclusive approach to music making, uh, to sonic creativities where focus on the sonic and the social experience instead of the technical development uh, or the musical virtuosity. But then also it's a claim to kind of promote network algorithmic spaces that are you know, more open or ephemeral, collective situations, experiences, explorations and forms, and also embracing sound-based music in the form of field recordings, noise music, DIY music, sampling, soundscapes, performance with objects, and sampling in live coding, which is also um, a theme that I'll present more in depth later. So then the proposal or the intention is to add sound to this name that in the original kind of uh, meaning refers to new novel interfaces, interactions, musical expression. So what if we add like this um, sound element in, into the equation, what happens? And so you will see, uh, I would like to yeah, rethink the NIME acronym, but also bringing sound, but all other connected qualities. So one is adding natural to the end. So that would also bring the kind of the ecological concerns related to planet preservation and includes more realistic rhythms. The I, uh, we can expand it from interfaces, interactions to more cross-disciplinary meanings such as interchanges uh, between disciplines or intersection between, for example, machine and human, intercommunication between uh, technologies, but also so that can be a space for more specificities or open forms such as ideas, concepts, or particular applications, immersive, intervention, intelligent, in instrument, and so on. The S, which is the bigger change. So here we would add the sonic, the sound-based music, sound making, sonic art, sound art, sonification. And the E, given that um, expanding it from expression that typically is linked to music. Uh, and so also the idea would be here to expand this uh, expressivity to, for instance, be more clear about potential uses in the educational field, but also uh, in a, kind of bringing the idea of context such as ecologies and environments. So here um, is like what I call a nice game. So this is an algorithmic, <coughs> excuse me, approach 
to this new proposal in which the sound becomes a part of the equation. And so this is available online if you would like to explore it. Um, what is this for? So one can be used as a speculative design tool, and two, it can be used to design, evaluate new musical interfaces, if you like. So as a speculative tool, uh, this working framework has been successfully tested with the master students of the Creative Technologies Master Program at Film Universität of Konrad Wolf in Potsdam, Germany, in which the students had this brief, working in teams, run the nice game, elaborate an abstract brief of the new nice, and then you can use mind maps or chat GPT for ideation and present your ideas at the end. So just to give you an idea of how this would work, um, I run like a, yeah, just an example here with ChatGPT and Crayon. So inputting the term novel intercommunication, sonification, evaluation, the results uh, bring like this information translated into sound that can be explored interactively. So Crayon offers images of how the interaction could happen. It looks quite esoteric, but further in iterations could be needed perhaps to find a, or refine the, this concept. So in, in fact, a follow-up speculative proposal by Crayon moves from this novel intercommunication sonification evaluation to an abstract representation of data through sound in scientific research. So here we would get a more specific way of representing data through sound, perhaps combining the temporal domain with the frequency domain, for maybe communicating complex scientific data in a meaningful way. The other way of applying this framework is designing and evaluating musical interfaces. And so I will present now three projects uh, kind of using uh, this new framework where sound has more presence. So the first one is an I'm, uh, an I'm using sound in education in the context of DIY music. The second one is on a name using sampling in live coding, allowing for live coders to tailor to their own environments in the context of music performance. And the third one is a name using sonic arts, soundscape music in the context of forest research. So let's go to the first one. Natural ideations for sound-based music education. So DIY music is a handmade hardware kind of music, typically noise friendly. And this practice connects with Nicolas Collins book, Handmade Electronic Music. So here in the photo, you can see Sam Topley, sound artist, a sound artist working with textiles to create a noise machine. I have been teaching DIY audio electronics for artists at NTNU in Norway and at DMU in, in the UK. So at NTNU, we taught uh, physical computing in the context of a cross campus of two separate classrooms, one in Oslo, another in Trondheim, and both were connected via an AV portal. So students were exploring physical computing within this kind of uh, connected space, if you like. And so we did a hackathon style of workshops across campuses. And we kind of promoted uh, participatory kind of prototyping, hybrid technologies, music improvisation, reflective practice. And most of the students were musicians, but with no background in computing or programming nor uh, physical computing, yeah. So here is, uh, you can see one of the projects developed during this hackathon. And so the students explore given like this situation of two campuses, audio feedback across the network of the two campuses. So meaning here, trying to find like this connection between an acoustic path that goes from an audio input, for instance, a microphone, to an audio output, for example, a loudspeaker. And so the technologies used, you can see them here, mobile phones, little bits, a JavaScript web sampler, Google Hangout, BB Audio Voice Meter, Banana, and Ableton Live. So it was quite a, quite a range of, of technologies. And we will listen to a short audio extract about this explore, sonic exploration.
Another example comes from uh, the Montfort, where I've been teaching also audio electronics instrument design. And this comes from this year's cohort. So this is a small cohort of students. And most of the students, again, are musicians, but they don't have background in programming or physical computing. So, and little interest also, interestingly, with, you know, not interest in, in learning it. So they are encouraged to work in teams and they are exposed to hybrid technologies. For example, Arduino, the Victorian synthesizer, sorry, synthesizer, pair of nails, and so on. Oops, <laughs> sorry. So here I would like to show you the bed of nails project. This is an homage to John Richards and the Dirty Electronics who uh, started this uh, kind of uh, space at the Montfort, uh, the music technology and innovation 20 years ago. And they've been exploring uh, these circuits uh, for a long time. So the circuit schematics are available online and it uses op hums uh, to create audio feedback. So the students learn uh, to read a circuit schematics and build a musical DIY from scratch. And so in this ver version that I work in class, the students get a pre-made piece of wood so that they can focus on the wiring and electronics, uh, but still getting the, the full experience. So let's watch a video uh, with the students kind of sonically exploring their recently made bed of nails. This is noisy, noisy friendly as well. So we move now to the second example. Uh, this project relates to creating new, but also using existing technologies within an existing environment or contributing to already formed environments. So the life coding is, have you, how many of you have heard about the life coding practice? Yeah, half of the room. So yeah, life coding is this artistic practice that relates to writing and executing code in real time that can create sound or visuals. For example, uh, something in life coding would mean using sound samples in, in the life coding practice, which is what we focus on here. And we also kind of published an article recently that tells or investigates how using the sound samples in life coding has an advantage uh, in terms of the low entry access to music ma making, and it's very much suitable for music improvisation. So in the photo here, you can see a from scratch session, uh, which is basically starting from the empty canvas uh, with Olivia Jack and myself, live coding, live coding sound samples from Freesound using the self-built tool Milka. So in this context, we developed this project Milka that uh, is a self-built tool that works as a customizable worldwide sampler with sounds retrieved from the collective online Creative Commons database Freesound. So the live coding environment was developed in Super Collider in conversation with the live coding community through a series of workshops and by observing it's used by 16 live coders, including myself. And so Milka is a super collider extension under development that allows users to customize this worldwide sampler by training classifier models to retrieve only the desire, desired sounds from free sound or sounds that you like. This approach promotes a hands-on understanding of machine learning and interactive machine learning using small data sets very much inspired by Rebecca Fiering's Wekinator. So one of the performances uh, was uh, done by four life coders from Top Lab Barcelona, who trained their own models and performed individually and then performed together. Uh, so it was a series of five performances. This session was based again with this 
technique, if you like, from scratch, which we can describe as a music improvisation technique in live coding, but also it's quite welcoming, so you can just go on stage and start exploring, and everyone will applause no matter what at the end, after nine minutes. And so you start, yeah, with this blank canvas, and it's a great, great uh, community uh, gathering as well. So although the four life coders are experts in life coding, uh, Ramon Casamajo, Ivan Path, Roger Pierre-Bernat, and Chiguire, many never used sound samples before. So they, they, after asking them how the sessions went, they found it was a suitable way of music improvisation and collaboration. And we will see a short video extract as well of, of this last performance, all together improvising the four of them. That's one example. Another example, I would like to emphasize the use of two life coding tools, one Milka for the sound, and then also Olivia Jack's Hydra for the visuals, for creating a life coding session and music piece that could exemplify this concept of a natural interface for sound-based music environments. And so this, uh, we will watch a short video extract that was presented earlier this year at the RAIN Film Festival. So this is a second example we've seen. Now we move to a third example, uh, exploring this nice uh, occurring. So this project relates to creating natural nimes as intervention to the environment through sonic arts and sonification. So a soundscape communicates an acoustic environment over real or an imaginary space, and it has been used in acoustic ecology to study the relationship between humans and their environment 
as part of a sound walk or as a mobile music experience, among others. And so here you can see in the, in the picture uh, Nella Brown, a sound artist, live streaming audio from Croatia in a concert by the Female Laptop Orchestra. So the Sensing the Forest project has been recently awarded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And the main research question is, what can we learn from using artistic and community science research methods employing the Internet of Things, acoustic ecology, and creative artificial intelligence in relation to monitoring forest behavior and raising awareness about climate change. So we plan in this project, which is a two-year project, to conduct two artistic interventions of different nature and also kind of raise awareness among the public uh, with kind of public engagement uh, activities such as seminars, workshops, and so on. So the team is inter- and multidisciplinary. We are artists and scientists working together to work on this timely issue using an original approach to gaining knowledge about this connection between forest and climate change. So we expect to use sound, sonic art, sonification as ways of communicating complex data with the general public. For example, by listening to online soundscapes, listening to on-site uh, sonic installations, and so on. So here you can see uh, the first intervention that we are working at the moment, and this is an artistic audio ecology intervention that concerns uh, forests. So we, we, make, we plan to make a one-year on-site and online artistic intervention in the Alice Holt Forest using life scientific data and fostering acoustic ecology experiences. So the plan is to emit live soundscapes, and this will be accessible both for forest aficionados and online viewers. And we will also use this data for later exploration of, of patterns in a performance space. So looking more closely on this intervention, uh, we are building an autonomous monitoring unit based on Raspberry Pi, and that is going to be solar powered and will be streaming, streaming live soundscapes. In fact, we will have two as shown in the previous uh, image. So one is emitting road soundscapes and the second is emitting in, intervene soundscapes where we will emit uh, the sounds produced from our sound installations. So Luigi Marino is leading this development and we are using open source technologies inspired by the Locus Sonus project. And so Luigi is currently streaming from, from Bristol. So let me uh, put that on. So I guess I need to drag this. Or yeah, if I can drag it, I just play it. Oh, look at that. <laughs> And now, boom. And we might keep it in the background. So yeah, we are working on, on this development at the moment. The second intervention, maybe now, well, maybe we can uh, lower the volume a bit so we can keep it in the background if that's OK. Thank you. So second prototype is exploring sonification um, as well as a technique kind of to uh, communicate complex information in a maybe more digestible way. So the idea here is also to use community science methods. So the plan is to develop an in-house Internet of Things prototype to measure the tree stress. So the plan is yeah, to build a DIY tree talker that you can explore in your garden and then look at this and listen to the sonifications, visualizations, and, and trying to understand how this tree stress works. And yeah, this is kind of uh, the second intervention, still early days, but it's good that, you know, sharing it here also for comments, feedback, and suggestions. So, in summary, we went through what is a nine in essence, and we also discussed some of its caveats when designing evaluating interfaces. 
especially techno-driven uh, kind of problems, lack of diversity, and the newest uh, for the sake of it. We also discuss the change of focus from music to sound and what can bring in terms of musical interface design, evaluation, but also community. The Sonic uh, can become a welcoming access point for music making and name design. So this has been discussed in this talk and is a kind of a, maybe a motivation uh, for, for bringing this uh, nice uh, framework. And also this nice framework contributes to the vision of democratizing sound and music computing through the creation of technologies that can empower the community. As a takeaway message, the dimension of sound is crucial for a broader, more inclusive, diverse perspective of designing names, which can bring other values, less technology driven and less linked to the new newness. So thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. There was a term you used partly through, which was a networked algorithmic space. Could you define that? I'm interested to know what that means. Thanks for the question. So I guess this is after the fact. So just reflecting on creating uh, spaces where you can create music with mobile phones uh, algorithmically. So it's never the same because you know the sound might be might be fair. Uh, reflecting back also on on this uh, kind of teaching spaces where it's chaotic but things happen. Um, reflecting on live coding also that every time is a different, uh, uh, if you like, musical session. So I guess it's after the fact of all these different instances trying to group it in a meaningful term. <laughs> um, I'm thinking about uh, music information retrieval and the expansion oh, the expansion of NIME to include sound-based practices. And I was wondering about sort of, there has to be this boundary between, you know, music information retrieval and sort of like machine listening. And I want uh, your opinion on, on that topic. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, there are quite close mu machine listening. I guess there is the real time side, at least from my experience, but still you are using uh, music information retrieval characteristics or information uh, kind of to then, yeah, if you, the machine to listen, understand, and then react. So I guess it's a complementary uh, uh, kind of perspective or domain, but yeah, you would need like, a uh, you would need MIR kind of to understand using different uh, characteristics, the sound signal, but then machine listening needs to understand these characteristics, but then probably react uh, uh, in real time, typically uh, to kind of, uh, yeah, behave, do something, or like in, in live coding, for example, you would uh, expand the, the signal or apply effects, but you need MIR to, uh, bring the, like this uh, layer of machine listening. Does it reply your question or? <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I'm thinking about um, MIR as it like uh, approaches to like Western, Western mm -hmm. style music and like sort of analyzing, you know, how we think of traditional Western music. And um, when we expand that towards sound-based pra practices, um, is there a different kind of music information retrieval? Well, I mean, tambour, even tambour tends to be quite present, at least with the work uh, presented here. But yet, yeah, the temporality varies as well. But this is uh, this is understudied actually, or uh, underdeveloped, and it's a, an important area of exploration. Uh, I would think, kind of, to bring more diversity. So. Uh, but then there's also, yeah, like in, in forest research, they do quite a lot of uh, listening and recordings from, from soundscapes. So there, probably there are connections that could be brought together. So probably there's research there, but, you know, maybe not applied to music, as you say, and it might be an interesting space for exploration.
Hi, thank you. Um, that was a great talk. There was loads of really good stuff in there. Um, but uh, the thing that struck me was when you were talking about live coding, I realized that I'd never seen um, live coding that wasn't like synthesizers and was using sounds and recordings. Um, and I really like what you're saying about using or kind of replacing the, the M with the S and, and bringing uh, people without a musical background um, into this world. And I was just wondering if um, kind of how much experience you'd had with students or, or colleagues who don't come from a musical background but working with live code because that to me sounds really interesting. But do they question for you? Do they have a programming background? You say or students with no background? Uh, either either way, um, I'm just I'm just interested um, to hear if if you've worked with people like that before. So the experience comes from workshops running the Milka, and through that they were exposed to uh, the library of kind of uh, working with free sound samples sound samples, and usually it's quite welcoming, I would say. The Milka site that is bringing kind of more like training and so on might be more complex, but some of the students just took like the part of managing sound samples and they brought it to their practice, which is great. Uh, so usually, yeah, it's a very nice entry point using sound samples, modifying them, uh, very much in inspired and influenced by electroacoustic music, uh, but applied to uh, yeah, electronic music. But then now the problem I'm facing quite a lot is students don't want to learn to code whatsoever. So that's, I think, a bigger problem. Uh, so then I guess using music has been always a way to, uh, yeah, just, you know, catch the attention of the students to programming. Uh, so I would say also it might be a way to attract students to, you know, yeah, creating their things through code. Yeah, I just wanted to build on those questions about MIR and diversifying that um, field. So, like, typically, obviously, we have quite universal approaches. Like, we have this metric, we have, like, we're looking for this beat detection, that kind of thing. Um, I was just wondering how you negotiate sort of um, the idea of sort of individual needs and uh, sort of negotiating that, that, I guess, then maybe they're not so diametrically opposed, but that sort of... Um, division between like a universal approach and like a more individualized approach in tools like the MIR um, project that you were talking about. I just wonder if you could talk about that a bit more. Yes, thanks for the question. So while Milka is a very humble approach, I would say to explore the, tum you know, the tumbler characteristics of a sound, but it's also true that for, like with this talk, but also there is this question moving forward about how to yeah, how to work with this type of music, maybe less westernized or more, you know, like more like noise based. Uh, so I would say I don't have an answer, but I'm also interested, you know, it's a, a research problem, I think. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, hi. Um, do you have any thoughts on, because the, um, non-community and academics is usually quite separated from the music industry and companies making software and hardware. Do you have any thoughts on how those companies can kind of recoup some of that kind of experimental spirit that is more present in academics and NIME? Thanks for the question. Well, actually the hackathon type of style, I think it comes more from industry, right? So probably there are more meeting points that we think uh, also, like the startups, usually it's also connected. But I guess, yeah, the, the experimental spirit needs to be there, right? So in both worlds. So I guess it's creating the, those situations. Uh, and, and yeah, we can learn a lot about industry in terms of rapid development that was discussed earlier in some of the talks uh, that could be brought also to uh, kind of uh, academia. But yeah, I think. There can be more meeting space, as you say, for exploration, and exploration should be always there just to open the minds and, you know, discover other ways. Yes, um, I would like to continue a little bit on, on that topic. Uh, so the 
sort of the commercial part of the audio technology and music technology industry um, can sometimes be very traditionalist or conservative in terms of, I mean, there is, as we have seen here these days, there's groundbreaking, incredible technology and all kinds of new developments, but the formats of products tend to be uh, very traditionalist and uh, what can the industry learn to improve on, on that and uh, maybe have the courage to experiment more? Well, I guess participatory design uh, kind of techniques or research methods, just wonder if, if you have considered them. I imagine you do, right, about getting user feedback all the time, but maybe considering uh, like other or other ways of, of getting feedback from, from the community and perhaps community that you never thought, getting those opinions on board might be interesting. So this diversity, uh, again, uh, Blair, can I share your stock uh, uh, previously? Uh, she was mentioning diversity brings innovation, right? So bringing this diversity into the team of opinions might be a way uh, kind of to, you know, maybe break the, you know, whatever you've designed and, or see it differently or, or branch it differently. But yeah, conver having conversations and participation could be a way uh, or expanding that participation. Um, coming to your um, concept of naturalness and your project in the forest, um, you're observing processes that can be extremely slow um, might take an entire year for the forest to change or go through certain processes or when you're looking at the tree um, changing its um, stress levels and things like that. How, what are some strategies for transferring kind of features that take a very long time into a piece or, or something listenable that, I, that doesn't necessarily take a year to listen to? Many thanks for the question. Yeah, I mean, this is something we are discussing with the team especially with uh, scientists, Matt Wilkinson in particular, because we are working on in the Alice Hall Forest for this first intervention. So the idea is to triangulate, if you like, or work with the data they've been collecting for more years. So that's one approach. So kind of, uh, uh, kind of gathering different type of data that has a broader time span. But also when collecting the data, just changing the mindset and thinking, as you say, like, you know, slower, uh, like, you know, the time is kind of, uh, kind of uh, longer. Uh, so the strategy will also, instead of uh, looking at, you know, the kind of the full, full length, just capturing snapshots, as they do also. The, uh, in Alice Hall, they, for instance, capture photos every, uh, say, hour. Uh, so following their approach applied to more artistic uh, research. But yeah, it's a great question because yeah, we are used to like this fast pace. What if we you know, slow down? We are not used to it, right? So yeah, it's also an open question for us. Do you think that the change of paradigm, both replacing M to S and the do it together instead of DIY, also blurs the relationship of the classical instruments of performer versus audience? Thanks for the question. Yes, I mean, and I refer back to this nice article on uh, do it together. So yeah, everything is questioned. So also the roles, ab yes, absolutely. So, but that's part of the game, right? It's just, just you know, just explore different ways, including the roles. So yeah, I agree that this is also questioned. Are any of your workshops or class content available online and where well, do we find it? Yes, yes. I mean, yes and yes. <laughs> so where to find it? Uh, okay, so, well, from this last, I try to blog, not, you know, I would like to blog more often than I can, but I try to blog and, and share also through papers and through GitHub, maybe less often now, but yes, um, I tr you can find it on this, uh, like on my blog or related blogs, but also GitHub, uh, if the code is relevant there, uh, and the project websites. So yeah, the idea is always to share in a way or in another uh, lessons learned and the materials used. Thank you for the question. 
And any other question in the room before we wrap? Okay, I think, I think that's it. Anna, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.